Go ahead. Hello, everybody. My name is Tyler. Um, I'm from America. I'm giving a presentation on the double mind of American police. So first and foremost, I want to start. Um, this is my mother was a police officer in uh, New York City. She worked for 20 years as a police officer. She was actually a sergeant. So I kind of have double mind with that already. And um, I just want to go through a couple things that what I think by doing my research and just from what we see daily is obviously double mind. So first, the police motto is to protect and serve. We see this everywhere on cars, protect and serve. This, these are what police officers are supposed to do in America. Now, my stats are going off of American stats. Um, so in your country, it may differ and they're the way they act may differ in your country. I'm just speaking on America, United States. So, like I said, the police model is to protect and serve. So, the police model is to protect and serve, but yet we deal with police brutality. So, um, we probably all know what police brutality is, but I'm just gonna read the definition. Um, police brutality is the excessive and unwarranted use of force by law enforcement against an individual or a group it is an extreme form of police misconduct and is a civil rights violation. Police brutality includes but is not limited to beating, shootings, improper takedowns, and unwarranted use of tasers. We all know what police brutality is, I hope we should. So um, in the civil rights movement, um, which was the 1950s and 1960s, and this is after, um, like, this is furthermore way after slavery, but this is like after, like during the Jim Crow laws where um, segregation was a big thing in the United States where um, um, blacks and whites were separated and they were um, segregated. So, but as you can see, we still dealt with this problem in the 1950s through the 1960s. As they say, police brutality must go. We demand an end to police brutality now. And you can see a um, police officer um, harming a person and people watching. So, yet, they were supposed to protect and serve since we've been here, since America has been founded. But even during the 1950s and 60s, we still dealt with this problem. So here are just some stats that I found online. Um, these are more. These aren't like the beating stats. These are more like violent offenses. So um, according to data collected by the Washington Post, police shot and killed at least 1,055 people nationwide last year. So this was in 2021. Um, and this is the most, the most since the newspaper began track, tracking fatal shootings by officers in 2015. So, so this is, that's from 2015, well since 2015 that they've been tracking. Um, and a new study on fatal police violence shows more than half of killings by police were left unreported in the last 40 years. So there's a lot of things that go on. So we only, honestly, we only see the ones that are promoted on TV which are like the big major ones like George Floyd, we all know the situation. Or there's a bunch of other names that were under there. And I just wanna make the point, it's not just more about black people, it's about everybody together because if we look at the stats, which I will show on the next slide, there's actually other races who um, fall on the other side of police brutality too. So um, like I said, so the ones that are not on TV, there's way more crimes that happen by police that are not reported, and we know why, because the police feel like they are in charge or they have an ego, which, like, they feel like this is their right to do since they're officers, since they have a badge that they can harm or brutalize a person just because of the badge they have on. So, also, a study found that, this is the, where the study was from, NVSS, underreported 55% of these deaths overall, but that percentage rose to 59.1% were reporting black Americans. So they underreport the deaths. So the things that happen in police hands are underreported. Things are not getting reported. And it rolls when reporting black Americans. So here's another st stats that I found online. And like I said, there's more, it's more than just um, black lives with police brutality. As you can see, white lives is very, very, it's a lot also. Unknown, I don't know, I guess unknown, whatever unknown is. Um, 
It just says unknown. <laughs> unknown. And then we have Hispanic, which is up there. So this is throughout the year. So from 2017, 2018, 2019, it kind of remained stagnant at a certain level. And then like right after 2020, it seems like it rose, which is kind of a bad thing. And this was, this is probably, this report was maybe in March or so. So it's definitely higher than 856 in 2020. And um, yeah, so you can see that, like the number of people shot to death by police in the United States from 2017 and 2020 by race. So this is a lot of people, like the fact that police are supposed to protect and serve. Yes, people may do crimes, and but I don't think any nobody deserves to get shot and killed in the hands of police or anybody in general because that's not what we should be doing. And like, as you can see in other countries, even Japan, you rarely hear um, police shooting and killing somebody or like really bad police brutality. So I think honestly it's uh, an American problem because the, the free use of guns and just the access to guns so much that it makes it a big problem. And then here's one about um, the phone calls. So researchers looked at a response to 1.2 million 911 emergency calls in the U.S. in a U.S. city and plotted the use of force involving a gun across neighborhoods according to their racial composition. White officers were more likely to use a gun than when black officers are more likely to do so in predominantly black neighborhoods. So this is just like people calling the police because they need help or whatever situation, whatever it is, and it seems like they're calling for help, but the police officers are making it worse by using their guns or using some type of force. So that's very unexpected. If you are calling a police officer to come to, to help you or to save you or whatever the situation or just to calm a situation down, the fact that they have to use a gun is kind of sad. And here's this, uh, another stat. This is just from just till May. So it says there has been eight days so far in 2022 when police did not kill people in the U.S. So only eight days. There's 365 days in a year. And you're telling me only eight days? That's kind of that's kind of crazy in my opinion. So this is a very big problem. Now, bad training. Can this be a problem? So I did some research on training in other countries in the U.S. because, like I said, my mother, she was a police officer, and she told me about her training, and it was honestly like a couple months. It wasn't like long, extensive training, and for, to be a cop in the United States is not hard. Like, usually, so my mother, she just needed a job. She needed an opportunity. She had a kid. This is before I was born, so like... This was her opportunity. This is the job that she got. So many people can be a police officer in the United States. You don't have to have the background of, of an enforcer or you can just honestly, I could if I wanted to. It's just about taking the test and passing the training courses. So police in the United States receive less initial training than their counterparts in other rich countries. Only about five months in a classroom and another three or so months in a field on average. So many European nations meanwhile have some more police universities so they actually have universities where they can go to school and really get extensive training for their job and this takes three or four years to complete so i feel like that is better so if you were trying to be a police officer you should have a couple years of training this is not just a couple months and then we throw you out in the field because you're dealing with all types of crime and you're supposed to protect and serve the community right so the median police recruit receives eight hours of de-escalation training compared with 58 hours of training of firearms. So this is kind of very low because what if a person has never used a firearm before or doesn't really know like, doesn't really know the power of a gun. So 58 hours is not a lot, 24, 48, that's two days and 10, and, uh, 10 hours. So that's honestly nothing to be training for to be in the field to be protecting people and using a gun, using a firearm, something that kills people. Um, the Marshall Project recently looked at 10 big city police departments and found that most, most officers like who have allegations of aggressive behavior are the ones who are becoming trainers. So these officers who have alleg allegations against them or they had cases where they've done something to a person, these are the guys or the women who are training the people. So
So they're basically projecting the way they, the way they act as a police officer, which shows between a whole group. Because if I'm angry and I tell everybody, when you see this person, do this, do that. But I have allegations for aggressive behavior in the past. That's a problem because many people would think that my behavior is correct when at the end of the day it's not. So few Americans, few American officers receive much education about the history of policing or the role of policing in a democratic society. So the officer coming out of one of the European training programs, he's much more likely to have a much broader perspective on what the job is or your role is, what your, what your society is like and how you fit in. And this is a study from a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. So basically, American officers are really not like, they really don't know their role or, or what their job is really like, not taking pride in being a police officer. These, um, these European training programs and other countries, they take pride in being an officer, and it's like their thing. Like, it's not about killing. It's not about being in power all the time. It's about protecting the community and serving the community. And then I found another double mind. So there's this thing that came about Blue Lives Matter. So during the Black Lives Matter um, period um, with George Floyd, and this started to come about called Blue Lives Matter. But it's been since the 1950s. This is basically just like a group protecting police rights and stuff like that, which is reasonable because police lives matter also because at the end of the day, yes, police do kill people. People do kill police also. So. It's a back. It's 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 a double entendre. But what Blue Lives Matter is basically saying that what they were trying to say is that Black lives don't matter and Blue lives matter. So like, who cares what you guys have to say? We're the ones who matter. And I kind of think this is a double mind because they're trying to refrain from their bad doing and try to make them seem like the victim when in reality other people are the victim of their crimes. So yeah, it was. Um, Blue Lives Matter is basically a mockery of Black Lives Matter, which is a double mind. So I think there's three double minds because the fact that my mom is a police officer and I've always felt like some type of way about like the way law enforcement is used in the United States. Um, not really praising them, but not too happy about them or like, I don't know, I never really cared. But, and my mom knows this because we've had talks about this and she's retired now, she retired a long time ago. And she's seen the difference between when she was policing, between now and what the media has like brought upon, how it's just more like, being a police now is just more, it's more violent, honestly, and just, just the way they treat people is horrible. So, yeah, like I said, the police model originally is to protect and serve, but through these statistics, it doesn't show that they're protecting and serving in the United States. But other countries, it may be different. I know other countries do deal with police brutality also. Um, but I feel like in the United States, it is a really big problem. So, Thank you. Any questions or opinion? So I have a question because I heard, and please confirm this, but I heard that also, like, like police is not like in you know this is like one big body but like many cells like independent cells like they are like actually each independent cell of police in each city and also like for the states and for the police and the police do you think that also might be a problem that because I heard that the tensions between those cells are also like quite big like they're like kind of a uh, rival for like, com like competitors for each other not like a one big body do you think that might be also a problem yeah i definitely think it's a problem they're called precincts and so they have specific precincts for specific cities um so in new york city where i live there's a whole bunch of precincts so the one who runs this precinct his mindset might be different to than the one who runs this other precinct he might be on the side of the community while the other one may not be on the side of the community so it does play a, play a part on like how policing is because like you said like it's different mindsets and they're all different and each state has different people so yeah that definitely does play a, mind, uh, play a part in police brutality. Are like police officers who like kill somebody sometimes persecuted? Like oh no oh and I, that's actually what I left out where I should have put in so most of the times honestly when police officers kill they literally 
get off. They get off of it. Um, they never really go to jail for it. Or they'll get suspended for a couple weeks and then they come back, like, if it's bad. But most of the time, it's in favor of the police. So they literally get off every, almost every time, which is kind of sad, but it happens a lot. Um, you mentioned that everyone, basically anyone could, you know, just sign up for it and eventually become a cop if they pass the training and stuff. Is there any kind of, like, background check, you know, if it's someone who is already, uh, who was called in for having, I don't know, anger management problems or caused some uh, problems in the past and now wants to become a cop? Is there any sort of, like, future to see? You know who can actually sign up for the uh, for the test or anything like that. Um, no, honestly, in terms of anger management problems, um, there's really not. In which I did a I did some research. What they're trying to bring about is like a test of like stuff like that, like anger management. The police should be tested on like how they act in certain situations with people and just who they are as a person. But they don't do that at all. It's just honestly, they go to the training. Yeah, if you have like a felony or you're like an offender of a big, big crime, then you probably won't even be able to get any type of job. But um, no, they don't. They actually don't look at that. They just put you through the training and you go through the courses. And it, if you seem like it's really no right fit, as long as you pass whatever you need to pass, you can definitely have a badge. Uh, so basically we were talking about how uh, there are some styles or uh, districts or something like that, like differences uh, within the police force. Uh, is every like every single cop allowed to carry a gun, or does it depend on you know if it's like state police or municipality or I don't know how it works. Every cop has a gun oh. in the United States, so like you can be the low the and which is kind of crazy. The high-ranking cops aren't in the field. They're not out in the field um, on patrol. It's actually the low-ranking cops and like the rookies. Those are the people who they send out to crimes and 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 go patrol the community. The ones who are just getting in or like the low-ranking cops. Like my mom was a sergeant, so she barely. At first, she was in the field because she was first getting like the first couple of years. But when a sergeant is high-ranking, so a lot of times she was at the office or she was going to a crime that happened like later on and investigation stuff like that so she'll just be there after everything happened but they're actually throwing the rookies and the people who the the fresh the fresh meat they're throwing them out in the field and letting them patrol the neighborhoods and they have guns so yeah okay well thank you very much okay good. <laughs> yeah. very interesting.